At midnight, on the 27th of June 1922, two artillery pieces were wheeled through the soft midsummer rain on Dublin's cobbled streets. They took up their positions along the river and set their sights on the highest court in Ireland. For days, the four courts had been the centre of a tense standoff between the Irish Free State that supported a newly signed Anglo-Irish peace treaty and the anti-treaty IRA, who had occupied the building in protest. This uneasy stalemate could only last so long, and at 4am, the Free State guns fired their first volley. The Irish Civil War had begun. Look to you. What it is you're fighting about. The treaty in question was supposed to conclude the Irish War of Independence with Britain, but many in the Irish Republican Army bitterly opposed it. The head of the anti-treaty forces stated that if the treaty were accepted, the fight for freedom would still go on, and the Irish people, instead of fighting foreign soldiers, will have to fight the Irish soldiers of an Irish government set up by Irish men. This self-sabotaging threat is eerily similar to Colum's threat in The Banshees of Inner Sharon. I have a set of shears at home, and each time you bother me from this day on, I'll take those shears, and I'll take one of my fingers off with them. Here, Colum threatens to mutilate his own fingers, just as the anti-treaty IRA threatened to assault its own nation. And just as Porrick refuses the ultimatum to leave Colum alone, the Free State fired on the IRA men in the Four Courts, leading to a cascade of violence. The parallels here are intentional. Banshees is, after all, set at the time of the Irish Civil War. The only difference is that the film takes place on the fictional island of Inner Sharon, just off the coast of the mainland. The island is apparently untouched by the conflict, despite constant reminders from faraway explosions and rifle fire. This sets up an interesting dynamic, as the Civil War can be seen in a purely allegorical sense within the confines of Inner Sharon. In fact, almost every character in the movie represents a different aspect of the conflict, one that we explore not through two warring factions, but two old friends that fall out with each other. McDonough's film starts after the Irish War of Independence, a time of immense optimism about the future of Ireland. However, it soon became clear that this future nation would not be the independent republic that many had fought for. Instead, the Anglo-Irish Peace Treaty would make it an autonomous dominion of the British Empire, with the British monarch as head of state. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, this caused a rift within the nationalist movement. Supporters argued that the treaty provided the freedom to achieve freedom, whilst its opposition believed it would never lead to full independence. Both sides wanted the same freedom. They just disagreed about how to achieve it. This disagreement was deeply personal. It turned comrades that had fought side by side in the War of Independence into sworn enemies almost overnight. Tear up that treaty. It's the only thing we've got. So then it starts. What? We fight. This is where the Banshees of Inner Sharon kicks off, with a sudden, heartbreaking and seemingly trivial end to a lifelong friendship. You didn't say anything to me. You didn't do anything to me. Well, that's what I was thinking, like. I just don't like you no more. And just as Porrick desperately tries to reconcile his friendship with Colum, so did the Free State try to compromise with the anti-treaty IRA. But it was all in vain. The situation quickly deteriorated into an all-out civil war, surprising many in Ireland and around the world. This bewilderment at a disproportional escalation is hinted at when Porrick questions why Colum jumped to severing his own fingers instead of trying to settle their differences in a more rational way. You've loads of options left open to you. How's fingers the first part of Col? So it seems as if Colum may represent the anti-treaty IRA whilst Porrick could be the free state. Further clues that point to this interpretation can be found in Colum's attacks on Porrick for being too nice. I suppose niceness doesn't last then, does it, Porrick? This is a possible hint at how the Free State compromised with the British Empire to prevent further war, instead of carrying on the fight for a republic. 
This also may be why Colum begins to like Porik more when he is drunk and aggressive. The fighting spirit has returned to his old friend. It's the most interesting he's ever been. I think I like him again now. Another theme that links Colum to the anti-treaty IRA is impatience. Colum fears that time is running out to compose his magnum opus and cement his legacy. I just have this tremendous sense of time slipping away in me, Parik. Rather than continuing to work as he had been, he decides the only way to achieve this goal is to cast Porik out of his life. This parallels the IRA's view that a republic would not be achieved if Ireland had to be a dominion of Britain, meaning that the free state was simply an obstacle that had to be pushed aside. It's also worth noting that the Catholic Church sided with the Free State and refused to administer sacraments to anti-treaty fighters, just as we see the priests sympathise with Porik and refuse confession to Colum. Well, I better not be dying in the meantime then, eh, Father? I'll be pure fucked. You will be pure fucked! Yes! You will be pure fucked! Though it is tempting, it's important not to get too wrapped up in trying to understand which side of the Civil War each of these characters represents. This is because there are so many contradictory hints that Colum is not actually the IRA, but the Free State. Such as when he tells Siobhan that all he wants is peace. Colum, what the hell are you hoping for, like? For a bit of peace, Siobhan, that's all. For a bit of peace, in my heart, like. This ambiguity is a point in itself. The Free State lads are executing a couple of the IRA lads. Or is it the other way around? I find it hard to follow these days. Wasn't well, that so much easier when we was all on the same side and it was just the English we was killing? I think it was. I preferred it. To Pedder, the conflict has become so meaningless that he forgets who is fighting who and what exactly they're fighting for. Nonetheless, it is apparent that the war is becoming increasingly severe. This tallies with real events. As the war went on, both sides started to carry out more atrocities, with politicians and prisoners being ruthlessly executed, often in retaliation for other atrocities, creating an endless cycle of violence. Soon, there would be no such thing as calling it quits. We won't call it quits. We'll call it the start. Again, these events are paralleled by the growing animosity between the two old friends. Porik begins to insult Colum with increasingly harmful words and actions, whilst Colum chops more of his own fingers off. Though not as visceral as Colum's, Porik's escalations are also a form of self-harm. By lying to one of Colum's musician friends about their father's death and encouraging them to leave the island, Porik develops a reputation for being cruel, which loses him his friendship with Dominic. I used to think you were the nicest of them. Turns out you're just the same as them. So Porik eventually becomes no different from the cruelty he is trying to fight. This senseless fighting culminates with one of Colum's severed fingers killing Jenny the donkey. This is an interesting moment as both characters seem to be united in their grief. Colum sees the brutal consequences of his actions and, for the first time, seems genuinely sorry for the harm he has caused. This is likely because donkeys are strongly linked with traditional Irish life, and despite the fighting, Colum and Porik are still old friends that share a love of their country, just like the Free State and the IRA. Moreover, donkeys are often portrayed in spiritual texts such as the Bible as symbols of peace and humility. In this way, the donkey may represent the innocence of Ireland that has been poisoned by bitter conflict. Of course, Jenny isn't the only innocent casualty. Siobhan and Dominic are both heavily impacted by the fighting, representing a whole generation that had their futures transformed by war. Despite the heartbreak of leaving her friends and family behind, Siobhan sees that there is no future for her on the small island of Inner Sharon. Can't be waiting around for any more of this madness. And vacates her homeland in a way that parallels the Irish diaspora. The same bleak future lies ahead for Dominic, though he does allow himself to dream about wedding Siobhan and living happily ever after. He probably wouldn't ever want to, I don't know, to fall in love with a boy like me, would you? Unsurprisingly, this is refused, just as the hope for a prosperous future following the War of Independence was crushed by even more fighting. Another possible link is between the character of Pedder and the British state. 
As the sole authority figure on the island, Pedder freely exercises his power over its inhabitants in a way that mirrors the British Empire at the time. Despite granting independence to Ireland in 1921, Britain remained closely involved in Irish affairs. It threatened to invade if Ireland stopped being a loyal dominion and supplied the free state with weapons to fight the IRA. Many on both sides despised this continued association with their former overlords, which is represented through Colum's and Porrick's attacks on Pedda. His abuse of his son, Dominic, may also indicate the mistreatment of Ireland at the hands of the British. This leaves the question of Mrs McCormick. What exactly does she represent? Well, her many warnings of impending death would suggest that she symbolises a banshee, a female spirit from Irish folklore that heralds the death of a family member and also forms the title of the film. The fact that they only predict and announce the deaths of family members is particularly relevant. Some accounts from Irish folklore suggest that there may have been a different banshee for each family, which makes the lone figure of Mrs McCormick especially tragic. It suggests that the inhabitants of Inisherin are so close-knit that they may as well be one family, a realisation that makes each act of violence even more heartbreaking. Haven't had any rifle fire from the mainland in a day or two. I think they're coming to the end of it. Eventually, the civil war did come to an end, with a victory of the Free State over the IRA. But little did it matter as Ireland became a republic anyway a few decades later. A year of vicious bloodshed had simply postponed the inevitable. Yet, unlike the minimal effect of war on Ireland's sovereignty, the effect on friends and families was much more tragic. Hundreds were killed and many took bitter memories of the conflict to their grave, leading to rivalries that long outlasted the war. This sense of irreversible damage is felt in the closing moments of the film. Some things there's no moving on from. And I think that's a good thing. Despite the lasting wounds, there is still some hope for reconciliation. After all, Colum and Porrick are still fellow Irishmen. Thanks for looking after me dog for me anyways. Any time. Yet the reappearance of McCormick's Banshee indicates that there's more bloodshed to come, a fact of modern Irish history that we sadly know to be true. Thanks for watching Socio Cinema, a channel where I read between the lines of the screenplay. If this sounds like something you're interested in, please do hit that subscribe button and check out my other videos.